pleased to welcome you all to tonight's event, a conversation between two scholars of Black Studies, Adam Womack and Amani Perry, who will be discussing Womack's new book, The Matter of Black Living, The Aesthetic Experiment of Racial Data, 1880 to 1930. In a moment, I will introduce our two speakers, but first, a little housekeeping. Tonight's event is a hybrid event with both an in-store, socially distanced audience and an online live streaming audience. We ask that for everyone's safety, you keep your masks on during the event. After tonight's guests have talked together, there will be time for a Q&A, and we will bring the mic to anyone who has a question so that everyone can hear you. If you are joining us online, you can submit a question for our speakers via the Ask a Question button, as well as via a copy of the book via the Buy a Book button. Um, and I should note that there are, uh, last time I checked, 100 people registered and about 50 people in, att in attendance online, so that's pretty great. Um, if you enjoy tonight's event, you can find future events under the events tab of our website, labyrinthbooks.com, and sign up for email events updates there as well. Now let's turn to our to tonight's speakers. Adam Womack is professor of English and African American Studies at Princeton University. Tonight's brilliant book is her first, but she is already at work on a new project tentatively titled A Speculative History of Black Film. Joining her to discuss her new book is Adam Womack's colleague in the African American Studies Department at Princeton, Professor Imani Perry, an acclaimed scholar and the author of several prize-winning books, including most recently, South to America, A Journey Below the Mason-Dixon to Understand the Soul of America. Professor Womack and Prof Professor Perry are intellectual collaborators in the classroom, having talked together on the work of Toni Morrison, and I am sure that their shared interests and commitments will make for a great conversation. Before they begin, I just want to say what a fascinating book we are here to talk about. The matter of black living directs our attention to America at the turn of the 20th century, a time when the growing disciplines of sociology and anthropology were preoccupied with the so-called Negro problem of free black life. The moral panic surrounding this problem led to a proliferation of data recording processes, which sought not only to register, but to capture and contain black life. But data is not only the province of social science. It is also an aesthetic category, the result of a process through which, as Professor Womack helps us see, diverse bodies and forms themselves get perceived as data. Data as such became the fertile ground on which turn of the century Black scholars and artists reconceptualized Blackness. Our age is still rife with the violent effects of attempts to catalog and control Black bodies. This is the compelling, this is the compelling story in this sense, an important prehistory of our time, of how Black thinkers like W.E.B. Du Bois and Zora Neale Hurston worked the nexus of Black life and data regimes to produce what Professor Romack, in a memorable phrase, calls undisciplined data. So please join me now in welcoming these wonderful scholars. Just right, uh, so this book is is um, and I'm gonna embarrass you a little bit, but it's <laughs> it's breathtakingly brilliant. Um, and you know, for me, as someone who it this is the period I worked on, so I have been looking at these figures and texts for literally thirty years, and uh, you have transformed my way of understanding them. Um, and it's period that the post film in many ways has been understood as subtle and you unsettle it. Um, and you reconsider in a just, to me, a remarkable way, the relationship between the social condition and the black imagination. I also think that um, this book is an is a offering of the genealogy of black studies as a field. Um, you situate what these thinkers are doing in a way that actually explains why African American studies isn't just black people in the various disciplines, but their relationship to knowledge that's produced by these conditions. So um, 
I wanted to ask you to start by giving us something of the sort of the broad contours of the project, your priorities, what were the urgent questions for you? How did you come to this? Thank you. First, thank you for those kind, beautiful words. Um, thank you for reading it. <laughs> I feel like you guys have all, you both have given such uh, beautiful language to the concepts um, that I was trying to get out of the book, so thank you for the, the careful reading. Um, so as um, you guys have heard, the book takes shape at the turn of the 20th century. So this moment really when there was a real crisis. I mean, there's still a crisis now, but like I can't overemphasize that the fever pitch that this question of free black life was being kind of articulated at, at the turn of the 20th century. And so I have always kind of understood it as being unsettled, right? Even as people kind of gloss over it and think of it as this really calcified time period. Um, and so one of the one of the big questions or one of the big objects of the themes of the book is really to kind of think about how intellectuals, cultural producers, everyday individuals were actually wrestling with the open question of free black life at that time period. So it wasn't something that we've only, you know, in our contemporary 20th century moment mapped onto the late 19th century, but I really was interested in, in, in thinking about and unraveling and unfurling how these people at this moment were also, also making sense of the so-called media problem and, and questions of freedom. As I began kind of moving from that approach, it became clear that there was no way to grapple with that question without grappling with the question of, you know, what at the turn of the 20th century would be conceived of these new kinds of um, knowledge production that were really taking shape around questions of data production. Mm -hmm. So like, to answer the first part of the question, I was like, okay, I can't do that without thinking about how data was being conceptualized and worked through and really the site of contestation for everybody, but particularly for black individuals who were the very objects and subjects of that data production. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of um, query, right, that position, that proposition, really led me to a bunch of different, or three in particular, um, sites of what I call um, data production or sites where, where data is produced, data forms you might think of them. So the book is organized into three chapters. The first chapter looks at the social survey as a data producing technology and data regime. Um, it's fallen out of fashion now as a mode of social inquiry, but at the turn of the 20th century it was the preeminent mode of producing and gathering racial data. Um, so folks like W. B. Du Bois and Philadelphia Negro, like he, he mobilized the social survey. And it was about going to neighborhoods, collecting information, and then producing data about that information. Um, so the first chapter really thinks about how the social survey was a site of contested knowledge production for everybody, but also it had possibilities for African American intellectuals. So, one of the things that the book is also looking at in each chapter is not just the way that, not just the data that was produced about black people. Like that's one thing and that's really interesting, but I'm really interested in the ways that African-American intellectuals on the one hand tried to produce their own data, also interesting. But more interesting to me is how they confronted these data regimes, often on asymmetrical terms. Mm -hmm. And the, that confrontation produced these surprising aesthetic outputs. Mm -hmm. The second chapter looks at photography as one such regime, and then the third chapter looks at um, early motion picture as well. So what I think is um, so interesting about what you just said is I think you make the point that data is something that's produced, right? Because often yeah. times in a colloquial sense, we think of data as the, like the, as data. the raw material, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? But then it's actually collected, and then yeah. that collection is not a kind of random objective process, but it is contested. Um, you, and, and one of the sort of figures who animates the text is, is Du Bois, and I think it's really interesting because you, you you use Quest of the Golden Fleece, which most, you know, I, would, I tell this joke in African classes all the time where I'm like, when people come into class, I'm like, so we're going to read Souls of Black Folks, something you've never read before, and they all laugh because they read it in almost every class. But you, you, you choose this other text because it offers something important about yeah. data and knowledge production, yeah. right? Can yeah. you say yeah, so I look at um, Quest of the Silver Fleece. Silver Fleece. No, no, no. It's golden as in Sol. That's all, right. They're all related. It's not all <laughs> kind of racial capitalism. Um, <laughs> but so Quest of the Silver Fleece is Du Bois' first published novel. It comes out in 1911 um, on the heels of souls. He was trying to stand up fiction. And so what's so interesting to me about that book is that there is 
this character named Zora. Um, and she is given to us as this totally incorrigible child of the swamp. So she emerges from this um, landscape that's all about unruliness, right? The swamp, historically an African-American literary production in life, has always been kind of this site of radical subterfuge, but also um, really exciting experimental aesthetic output, right? So we can think of, you know, uh, Marunaj, right, as kind of this really fertile ground for, for Black life. And so in, in the book, Zora emerges from this swamp, and she's kind of this uncalculable force um, and in the early pages of the novel, she's presented to us as somebody who totally exceeds all of the forms of disciplinary knowledge production that Du Bois was interested in and, and had his own kind of, um, you know, vexed relationship to. But also all the characters in the books are variously interested in different kind of reforming processes, mm -hmm. right? Whether those be financial or educational or actually, you know, counting and, and quantifying, right? Individuals and bodies, we have to figure out how many people are living in the South and this takes place um, in the rural South. And so Zora, for me, becomes the occasion to start the book because she she names this incompatibility between turn of the 20th century data technologies that are supposed to, that are designed to control, to capture, to quantify the unruly, and she just can't be contained, right? Yeah. In the first part of the book. So it's this, it, it becomes both a real metaphor for a real problem, but also it stages this really beautiful um, confluence of the unruliness of black life, and unruly not in kind of the undisciplined and pejorative way, but in the really beautiful way that cannot be contained ever within the, the kinds of quantifying disciplinary regimes that have been designed to contain it. And so we see that quest, I think, as the aesthetic output that emerges as Du Bois is trying to wrestle with these, these two things. And you, and, and you really sort of, you re, maybe the word isn't re-periodized, but you challenge the sort of the, the trajectory that people offer yeah. Du Bois usually. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that there's a way, I mean, Du Bois is such a, um, a friend of so many people in so many fields, <laughs> um, because there's just so much to work with. But there is a way that we think of you know, the pre night pre souls Du Bois, right? Who was kind of the um, deeply invested in quantitative sociology, mm -hmm. right? And deeply invested in empirical methods for thinking about black life. And then there's a way in which a lot of us have thought about souls as kind of the break from that, right? And part of this is the way he's narrated his own genealogy himself and his autobiographies. Um, and then we have the Du Bois who's starting to get literary and political with the crisis and all of that. And then we have the Du Bois who makes an even more radical break in the, the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. But I think if we think about Quest as really a signal text, right, in his life um, and in his creative thinking, it actually, you know, it, it challenges this idea that there was ever a clean break with sociology. It challenges what we think of sociology as a field, right? Um, in the book, I invite us to think of it as something that takes fiction seriously, right, as a mode of knowledge production even as sociology isn't necessarily, you know, claiming that on the page. Um, but I also think, you know, it reaches forward to something like Black Reconstruction, right, mm. in a way that is really useful for thinking about the way that Du Bois is always thinking about how to, how to wrestle with this really dynamic confrontation between what I call data regimes and Black life, but that's maybe the thing that he keeps coming up and we see it again, you know, he comes up, he, he returns to the social survey in the 20s and the 30s, he tries to reactivate all the Atlantic University studies that he started in the turn of the century. So it's something that, you know, it's not a, it's not this kind of linear teleology of, of thought. And I think Quest helps us to, 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 to see that or to see that up. And I, I mean, what I, I find so useful about it is it's, relatively easy to see Du Bois as someone who's trying to make political argument using different tools. What you're asking, I think, that is even more prov provocative and useful is he's struggling with the question of how to know something about Black people that yeah. then you put to use. Right. 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 I love the, no, I think that's exactly it, right? It's this, and at the heart of that, I think, is this, this idea that he wrestled with that, like, if Black people and Black is, isn't, isn't knowable in right. any, Kind of form that we have, yeah. right? It, it needs this kind of constant reworking and evolution, right? Um, of forms, I should say. Um, yeah, but I think it's that it's it's always an open <coughs> question for him, and something that he never 
you turn away from. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, that's where your, that's to me sort of part of your your announcement of why Black Studies, what it does, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's methodologically that yeah. disciplining data is partially yes. what, that, what that is, yeah. right? And what we're different. Yeah. And then you bring um, somebody who's lesser known mm -hmm. into the picture, but really critically important, mm -hmm. Kelly Miller. Yes, and your friend. Yes, and your friend, a mathematician. And I would, you know, I would love you to talk yeah. a little bit about him, but also about, uh, there's so much that comes through his critique of Hoffman's yeah. sort of racist tracks, race yeah. traits. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, so Kelly Miller, he's one of the unsung heroes, I think, um, of this, this post-bellum pre-Harlem moment, although he worked far into the Harlem Renaissance, it's been coming out. So he was a mathematician, he became dean of Howard University. So he was right in there with Du Bois and kind of all of these, these sociologists, Ida B. Wells, right, really thinking about quantification, numbers, counting, right, mathematics, right, what we now might call like the mathematics of black women, right, he was thinking about that very thing um, in the 1880s and 1890s. And so he really could hit the, the stage um, nationally with his publication of a review of Frederick Hoffman's Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro, which was published in 1896. And then Miller um, wrote this review in 1897. So Hoffman's Race Traits was the text for thinking about blackness and thinking about um, the futurity, or as he argued, non-futurity of, of black life at the turn of the century. So he gathered statistics from the 1890 census, repurposed them in this document that was um, created for uh, prudential life insurance. So the entire document was about kind of betting on the subprime value of black life. So it was always about you know, that black life does not have a future. And he used the statistics to predict that in the future, you know, the Negro problem will work itself out because blacks are going to go into extinction, right? There's no way that they can survive in the aftermath of emancipation outside of the plantation. And so Kelly Miller in 1897, he shows up at the American Negro Academy, which was one of these, um, one of the many kind of opportunities for African-American intellectuals to gather and kind of give their solutions to the Negro problem. Um, and he wasn't supposed to be on the program, there was a cancellation, but he gives this speech that ends up being published as his review of Kaufman's race traits. And what's so interesting is he, he categorically goes through and he debunks every one of, of Kaufman's claims. And he, the, the point he ends up proving is that Statistics are not something that just emerge, right? You, the facts don't speak for themselves, as Hoffman claimed. They're subjective, they're narrative, right? We can we can make whatever story we want to out of the numbers. And so he he does that. Um, he comes to the conclusion that Hoffman's a bad statistician, there's no merit here, blacks are not on a downward decline. But he also embeds into it this really beautiful, I'd argue in the book reading of statistics and social sciences actually having a lot in common with fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so he makes this offhanded um, reference to Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, which I remember I teach 19th century I think my students here will know it's Uncle Tom's Cabin is like the text that everybody returns to in some, some shadow way. So he makes this reference to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and I think one of the things that he's inviting us to think about there is that statistics and melodrama actually have much in common in the way that they are predicting and narrating black life. And that allows him, ultimately, in chapter eight, I show how he looks to other forms of fiction. But it's, so he's, you know, he's this really interesting figure that we don't give much or as much consideration as we should, partially because he wasn't, he wasn't as public facing as somebody like Du Bois or Booker T. Washington, right? He didn't have kind of the national backing that they had. Um, he could be rather conservative, but they all were at the time. He's really wasn't. Um, and he was an educator, and he right. was an educator, right? I mean, he really was interested in redesigning curriculum at Howard University, and also, you know, really redesigning what counted as knowledge in D.C. So he had drafts for the first plan of the African American, the National Museum for African American History. So he was all about kind of what are the forms, right? What are the structures that might produce a different kind of racial data, right? How do we tell the story differently? And for him, the museum was actually a really powerful place that we could collect and curate materials to produce a different kind of knowledge structure. That um, I, I think you know part of what was 
what resonated so deeply for me with his approach is that if it, you know, challenging the, and it's not clearly disciplined, but challenging the statistics as an absolute by pushing for greater rigor, right? Sort of more detailed examinations. Yeah. Of yeah. 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 Which I think is sort of the tool of the interdisciplinarian to make the argument, right? Right. Yeah. Right. right. And it wasn't a, I mean, it wasn't a thing that there wasn't like, you know, we, I mean, even now, if there wasn't a way to think about the data interdisciplinarily, socially, mm -hmm. right? And he was like, he's a bad statistician. Right. Because he's, <laughs> because he's, he's just kind of recapitulating what we already see. Right? Right. He's not actually, he's not coming to any new conclusions. And what's the use of data if you're not producing a new story? Because it's kind of, I think, what's underpinning. And it's, it's a slim little test. It's like 20 pages or something. Um, but it, it has a punch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then you, well, I, I'm trying to think. I, I, so we've talked a bit about the survey. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about photography mm -hmm. and, in particular, um, the Baker family, the survival of a, of a lynching, which, since the first time I heard you talk about this, just fascinated me. Yeah. Can you tell that story? Yeah. So um, the Baker family is the centerpiece of Chapter 2, which is photography chapter. Um, I I have to say, it wasn't always clear to me how that chapter was going to to, to come into being. Um, but I, I stumbled upon it not the right word because it was a lot of intense research. But I worked with this archive that um, surrounded a family who survived an 1888 lynching in Lake City, South Carolina. Um, the victim of the lynching was Fraser Baker, who was a postmaster of the town, and as we all know, black success you know, attracted mob violence. So among about 500 people, half of the town's population, I'm sorry, half of the town's 500 person population, 250 people, set fire to his house, which was also serving as the big post office. Um, and he, he was killed, and so was their um, two-year-old daughter. Uh, Lavinia Baker and five children survived the lynching. Um, so almost like immediately, they captured the nation's consciousness as, you know, just people couldn't quite make sense of a family who survived a lynching. Like, lynching is supposed to end in death, right? How do you kind of think about that which survives when they're embodied individuals? And so within a year, they were really thrust into the national spotlight first as um, witnesses in the trial against the 11 men charged with lynching them. The only reason it went to trial is because um, mail was burned. Mm -hmm. And so it was a federal crime to burn government property because the mail is government property. Um, so they went to trial and the family was compelled to testify on the witness stand. Um, and so what immediately became interesting when I started looking through the testimony is that the, the mother, Lavinia Baker, and her two eldest daughters, uh, Cora and Rosa, they kind of gave an account of the night in like these highly photographic terms, right? I mean, they would talk about like the flash of the guns and, um, you know, just photographic language was, was really relevant in testimony. Um, it's even more interesting, right, because we think of lynching traditionally as something that's so amenable to photographic capture, right? Photography is how we get evidence and data about lynching, right? This is, was crucial for Ivy Wells, it was crucial for anti-lynching advocates, right? We need data, visual data about lynching in order to hopefully stop it. But they were doing something different with the photographic language and actually setting up lynching as something that was not conducive to photographic capture. And I argue that part of what was happening there is that they were suggesting that there's a, there's a dissonance between lynching when we think of it as survival and survivors and this photographic technology of capture. Then they went on to become um, the stars as it were, of a wildly popular anti-lynching performance spectacle a reported 3,000 people came out to see the show in uh, Rhode Island and Boston. Um, that was a mix of anti-lynching speeches, and then they performed, right? So they were compelled to show their wounds, um, and then it kind of erupts into this disruptive improvisational dance, I, I argue, before the mother kind of re refuses not the right word, but one off script. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm really kind of thinking about how do we think of photography and technology of capture in relationship to lynching, and this family who survived a lynching and really begs the question, and this gets back to kind of the question about 
the unknowability or uncapturability of black li living and life is like how do you capture that which is still ongoing like mm -hmm. what is the the visual medium or the visual apparatus and this family is, is pushing against the technology and theorizing i think mm. kind of a different visual epistemology that can see black living as something that's ongoing mm -hmm. right um yeah. What if, I mean, there's a, you have a sentence and I don't, because I read it on, I read your book online at first, so I don't have the page number, but the, it just resonated so much where you talk about the performance transformed the scene of lynching from a sort of public spectacle of white supremacy to a, a black domestic nightmare. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's just actually stunning. the sentence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's just a stunning, because it's true, right? And it's sort of, you know, right. yeah, yeah. Because I think like the thing, um, and my friend and colleague uh, Lee Rayford has talked about this beautifully. Like the way that the thing that white supremacy is after is actually like black privacy, right? Like that's what's the, that's the threat. Um, and I think that what we see here, right, in the lynching is this, you know, this invasion mm -hmm. of of black privacy, but also like white supremacy doesn't become the subject of it anymore. Right. right when we see this family on the stage and kind of bearing out kind of the the aftermath like the ongoingness of it right mm -hmm. um and the testimony that Lavinia Baker gives is really all about that invasion of privacy um and she actually articulates that by refusing in many chances in many instances to give the full account of what happened yeah. um and she's like this is actually not <laughs> about kind of the public display of white supremacy as we understand it yeah, can you say a little bit more? Because I was really intrigued by how you talked about her going off script, right? Because mm -hmm. it's here's a it's a, you know so there's a spectacle, the spectacular form of lynching. Here's a here's a counter spectacle mm -hmm. that is choreographed, right? And then she disrupts that structure. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's I think it's the second night of the show's Boston tour, um, and. You know, as you're saying, there was this really tightly choreographed program where, like, the the white woman who orchestrated the entire production, her name was William Jewett, where she would like give a speech, then she would invite some anti lynching activists, and then she would compel the makers to the stage. And there was also a photographic archive, a film, posters. Right, this family was at the center of a really multi multimedia show, and there were these portraits, like photographic portraits of them too, which I talk about quite a bit in the book. Um, and so it's important that on the stage, the family reenacted the visual um, setup of the photographs, right? So they're tightly, tightly, tightly choreographed. Um, they bought on singers and, you know, old kind of abolitionist performers. And so at this one moment, when Lavinia Baker is supposed to just be performing her stillness, performing her, her status, I think, as kind of, a kind of evidence, a kind of data about lynching, as there's conflicting reports about what's happened, what happened, but we know that she got up and had some kind of improvisational bodily movement. Some reporters um, for the Southern newspapers describe it as kind of minstrel like performance. Um, the Boston Post, which was incredibly generous to William Jewett, the white woman, just said like she got overcome by nerves and exhaustion and just like fainted mm -hmm. and fell back. There's accounts of her like throwing her baby and doing like a corn shock. Like, so whatever she was doing, right, it was disrupting and interrupting the expectation of what black mourning should look like, what the evidence of lynching should look like, what a photograph subject should look like. And she throws the entire kind of temporality of this, this affair into crisis. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a conceptual nightmare, <laughs> to use that word again, yeah. and no one can make sense of it. And like after that, the show immediately closed. Um, and they're like, we, have, we, cannot, we cannot risk kind of the impromptu, unscripted, undisciplined, right, bodily movement. Um, that actually is always kind of what's, what's there. I mean, it's so, I mean, it's so, it resonates so deeply, right, with the logics of protests and what yeah. The, yeah, 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 what you're not right, 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 yeah, can you, um, describe, I know we need to switch, switch transition to questions a little bit, but I just want to ask two more, yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, um, so what, can you talk about what you, this, this, um, kind of concept that you developed of looking at, because mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's incredibly useful, um, yeah, 
Or yes. it, it, it's like a double or triple entendre. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so I come up with this, or I developed, I should say, um, this theory of looking out to think about um, another kind of black visual praxis or visual epistemology. And it emerged from my deep thinking with this series of photographs of the bakers. Um, so there's seven extant photographs, mm -hmm. no, eight, I think, extant photographs, and there might be others, um, but they're all formal, staged in a, um, a photographer's studio, so they're, you know, they're, they're professional um, photographs. And the eldest daughter, uh, Rosa, in each photograph is, like, t again, improvisational and, like, kind of going off script of what she's supposed to be doing, and she is, like, always doing an iteration of a smile or a smirk. Um, she's, she's, everyone else is serious, deadpan, like performing grief, and she's just a little, like, has a reaction that's very vis visible and visual. Um, and so I really wanted to think through, like, how we make sense of this visual gesture uh, or this photographic gesture um, that's being staged there. And normally, one of the ways that we think of you know, a resistant Black photographic practice is reversing the gaze. Right, or like looking back, right? I'm going to um, meet the photographer head on. I'm going to not just be a passive subject, right? I'm going to take up the photograph, the, the camera on my own terms, and produce a different archive of black life. And I think those are all powerful and important. But it seemed like there was something else that was happening here. And, and I, um, I forward the term looking out as a way to make sense of and look for and kind of visualize what's always on the threshold of catastrophe, right? Which is a way that we can make sense of, of black living, right? Mm -hmm. So always um, kind of think about the ongoingness of the violence, right? Not something that can be captured, but also to always be, to be on the lookout, right? To be yeah. on guard, right? Yeah. It's like, it's what Ida B. Wells was saying when she's like, you always have to have a Winchester shot rifle right? by your bed because you have to be looking out, right? So it's a way of thinking about kind of a different temporality of photography, kind of a different um, ethical charge, I think, of, of black visuality and um, and black um, a black photographic practice or stance, yeah. um, and it then becomes, I think, something when we when we think of trying to see or capture or visualize the ongoingness of racial terror, then we can see kind of a different effort of black intellectuals who were working with photography in the name of anti lynching reform. That it wasn't just about proving the fact of lynching or proving that it was bad, but actually about sounding an alarm, right? Yeah. Um, actually about thinking about it as a, something that is always unraveling, that lives in the body, that doesn't just, um, can't be captured as seen as death, right? That mm -hmm. you know, thinking about black living, black death, not as binary opposites, but as kind of deeply informed categories. And I think that's you know, something that Du Bois was thinking about when he was trying to make sense of how to print lynching photographs of the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes this way of, of mapping a different kind of trajectory of, of black photographic practice. Yeah, it was part of, you know, what what I, you know, what I, I appreciate that sort of the real texture about not just black, I think black intellectual life that is politically informed, but is also a, sort of deeply imaginative. And yeah. so it's not, you know, you resist what I think in some ways is because we call it easy reading, it's almost automatic. This is resistance, this is you know argument for A, B, C, D, right? To actually think about what 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 the doing was in the context, right? And then the, yeah, the materiality of the experiences yeah. and the and yeah. Yeah. And like also the materiality of the technology. Yes, too, too right? Right. That like the people and the folks that I look at in the book were like we're really kind of deeply engaged with what the limitations and possibilities of these technologies might be, right? Like not coming to them with a fully formed idea of how I'm going to mobilize photography in the lynching toward, I mean, in the crisis towards anti-lynching, right? But like, what are the what are the possibilities that are embedded in a technology like the camera? Like, what can and can't film, like as a, a film or what can and can not capture about blackness and black life, which is I mean, and which is what you do with Zora, who is, yeah. how, I mean, who is so deeply beloved. I mean, she's yeah. you know, sort of like, you know, there's like mother and father, right? To yeah. and Zora. <laughs> um, Zora and Hurston. And, and um, you know, you the, the you read her film very differently mm -hmm. than most do. Mm -hmm. And again, I think incredibly compellingly as part of that process, right? Yeah. yeah. Trying to, yeah. It's a critical process. 
Yeah, so she, because she produced these films between 1927, well, we don't know when she's up. We have films from 1927 and 1930 that are normally always read as evidence of her, her ethnographic work, right? And she was a trained anthropologist, and she was also in this other sort of extension of the 1890s um, Negro problem that was also trying to figure out what's, what is the meaning of black life, but in a 1920s context, when everybody thought they knew, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there was still a different investment in, in mining information and data about black life. And she turns to film, um, and I argue with really with a sense of curiosity and skepticism and experimentation, like what, what might show up on this film when I record black life in the South? Like, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's different than saying she, sought to kind of capture a particular um, account of black people that she would then use in her ethnographic work. And I instead like actually read what shows up on this film, which is often a lot of nothing, <laughs> right? In the best sense of the term, there's overexposed parts of the film. There's, you know, the camera turns over sometimes, her thumb is often covering it. Um, so there's this way that I argue that what we, what the, what's important on the film is actually what ca can't be captured on the film, which is kind of the vitality of black life. And always the two butt up against each other and produce this different kind of aesthetic encounter, which I describe in the book as overexposure. So it's another kind of useful way of thinking about a different relationship between data and, and these data technologies in black living. Okay, I'm going to give up. I honestly don't want to take it away. It's <laughs> just extraordinary, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt. But I imagine that there must be questions um, in the audience. So if there's anybody who would like to ask, just put your hand up in the air, and I will bring you the microphone. <laughs> Because one of the ways that I think we think about the relationship between data and black people um, and black life is that like it's an extractive relationship, right? Like I'm going to get information or get knowledge, right, about this event, this group of people, this singular body, right? I mean, we can think historically, right, of all the ways into the from beginning kind of in the 18th century, right? About if not earlier, but you know, it's an extractive process. It's about getting something out. Um, and I think what that, and I think this does get to your, the, the 21st century, I think what that presupposes is that there is an, there is an ease with which black people and black life can be converted into data, right? That there's a compatibility, right? That blackness and data are mutually constitutive, right? Um, and I think actually what we see in this moment in the 1880s, 90s through the 1920s is these black people and black intellectuals and cultural producers putting that oversimplified over relationship to the test mm -hmm. and actually showing that it's not an easy, it can't be easily converted. Like black mm -hmm. people cannot easily be converted 
into data or information, right? Kelly Miller's like part of the problem with Roger Kaufman is that you're oversimplifying these processes. Like when we actually think, you know, capaciously, there's not an easy, there's not a chart, mm. right? There's not a number. There's not that you can, that is an analog for this, this historical event, right? This is also with Du Bois, right? How do you kind of collapse a historical phenomenon into a chart? You know, even those data portraits that he does are actually more kind of labyrinths than destinations. Mm -hmm. um, they, what do they actually give us? They don't, it, it's a labyrinth, right? It's, a, it's about kind of the process. And so I think that, like, to get to think about, like, the datification in the 21st century, and I talk about this a little bit in the coda, I wish I had done it more, is actually that like, maybe the charge needs to be that kind of slow down and not move from the assumption that black life can be converted into data. Um, I don't know if that, that makes sense. <laughs> Doesn't get to the film. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Autumn, congratulations. Thank I can't you. wait to read the book. Um, and um, for you to sign it. So my question, I just wanted um, to hear your thoughts about how this project, in which you pursue this history of intersection of race and data and aesthetics, how, um, how that made you rethink, um, um, rethink archival research more broadly, mm -hmm. um, especially because, so what I mean by that is how um, the, this research that you've done on data, race, and black life, how that might have um, spurred a rethinking about how we approach the archive and how you conduct archival research. Um, because, you know, we can, we can conceive of the archive as a kind of, um, um, also a site of data and, and yeah. accumulation of data. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to invite you. Yeah. Awesome. No, it's such a good question, and it's also such a good question now, given the way that um, we think of the accessibility and digitization of archives, right? How everything is kind of has that back, like an algorithm on the back end of it. Um, I mean, I can I can say that I really ran up against some ethical. Mm -hmm limitations or challenges when I was writing about the Baker family and the entire thrust of that chapter was is I hope about the, the challenge that comes with trying to document and produce data about an ongoing crisis um, and it was really hard for me to figure out a way to write about this family to write about this archive of photographs without kind of falling into um, the trap of writing about them as as objects that ended, you know, when they were, whose life ended when they were cataloged, and in many cases miscataloged in the Library of Congress. Um, I found them in the family photograph section, um, even though I think that they're, they're really cheap photographs in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the answers is, I think a lot of folks who are, who are wrestling with the same question, what they also do is kind of take on a different writing approach, which is a much more speculative, um, much more invested in the subjunctive, um, which I try to do a little bit in the second chapter, or the top of the chapter. Um, but I mean, I also, I think it's, it just, I was constantly kind of returning to the archive. So like not ever thinking, it, thinking of it as something that can be exhausted. Right, um, but also kind of looking at different sites that we might not think of as locations of archival knowledge, right? Which is like, you know, we performance studies folks do this all the time, but I think for people in literary studies, it's not, you don't always look at the live performance or records of live performance as, as an archive, right? So I think kind of expanding what counts as the archive um, is another way that I, I try to do it. But it did, I mean, it was it's something that I thought about in every chapter. If the whole point of this book is like how do you reconcile the living with the data and this is what these people at this moment were confronting like how do i also write and think and research with that spirit um so you'll have to let me know if i succeed i know you're, you're a top critic <laughs> you'll tell me the truth <laughs> 
I think we have time for about one more question, maybe two, if there's anyone else who has something you'd like to ask. Thank you so much, Dr. Womack, um, Dr. Perry, for this conversation. I'm interested in, like, there's so much around silence when we think about the archives um, in this moment and earlier. Mm -hmm. Antebellum, postbellum, and what I hear is the opposite of silence from this conversation. Like that, there's so much thick richness, um, and I'm just inspired, and also wondering how how you feel data um, in in this moment of late 19th century function to to fill the archive in a specific way? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's such a good question. Um, I mean, one of the things that was like dizzying about writing this book is that this period is, there's so much going on. It's like everybody was doing everything. Disciplines were not born. Like questions were, it was really like, everything was happening. I, I had a really, it was a challenge wrangling all of the social, political, everything's happening. But I think as a result, I mean, we do often think of like, the Black archive as being about Black and silences. And like, you know, we have to then piece it together. And that is true and that is right. But a couple of years ago, I was on a panel at MLA, the keyword panel, and this really brilliant woman, Laura Helton, she's from Delaware. She was like, you know, I'm gonna get wrong. She's like, the keyword for the 1890s is that if, it, if Black, is like the, the, you know yeah, the nice thing, right? Then then it's like overabundance and excess. I mean, everybody was collecting. Like so, there's the personal archives, institutional archives. Everybody was like, you know, in the face of folks saying we have no history, we are going to overproduce the history in this moment, right? We are going to write, we are going to collect, we are going to archive, we are going to build institutions, right? You write about this so beautifully. Um, and I think there's another really rich archive. Like if slave ledgers are the antebellum version of kind of a data archive, then there's so many racial statistics in the 1880s and 1890s. Like everybody was answering the Negro problem by producing data, producing numbers. We just need more facts, right? Um, every you know benevolent association. This is also the rise of the charities organization. Like they were all producing their own data. Um, we, if we have the numbers, I mean, we do this now, right? If we have the figures, we can solve the problem. So this was, as it was, this was the, this was word on the street in the 1880s and 1890s. So there is a real archive of black life, even in this archive of black death, which was what these statistics were, that's kind of exploding and I think really understudied in the 1880s and 1890s. It's very tedious. I mean, Hoffman's book is like 500 pages or something, but there's just so much racial accounting um, that I think I would love. I mean, Kula Muhammad does this really beautifully, but I mean, there's just, there's so many statistical reports. Um, so I do think there's, you know, just as there was a, there was this really important moment of black studies where I think not everybody, but important scholars and students were looking to the, the slave ledger as this really rich site of, of racial knowledge, I think there's a lot of work to be done in this statistical moment of the 1880s and 1890s. So that seems like a really beautiful and exciting place to conclude, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Lillian, and Dr. Perry for coming in.